Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Apologies the late uh, start to the live stream, but uh, we're here now and we're all good to go. So today we are talking about Monte Carlo methods, one of my favorite type of methods for reinforcement learning. They're so simple yet so powerful, and they actually have lots of use cases outside of um, reinforcement learning as well. So let's just jump right into it. Here we go. Lecture number 16, Reinforcement Learning and Monte Carlo Methods. So just to let you know that this is covered extensively in Chapter 5 in the Reinforcement Learning textbook. And so it's for free online. I've linked it before. Um, and Chapter 5 goes all about Monte Carlo Methods, and it's a really great read. I highly recommend giving that chapter a read before the exam because I think they explain it in a slightly different way than I do, and getting both points of view will make it really uh, hit home, I think. And again, uh, there is quite a bit of text in some of these slides, and the reason for that is because um, I want you to use the slides as study material because I can say, okay, if it's in the slides, then it's on the exam. So what are Monte Carlo methods? Um, Monte Carlo methods are methods used for estimating value functions and discovering optimal policy. So they're one of these ways of um, estimating the value functions that are so prized in reinforcement learning. Because if we know the value of doing actions, then we're just going to take the thing that, that uh, leads to the best value. However, unlike dynamic programming that we talked about before, we do not need to assume complete knowledge of the environment and we do not need a model of the environment. So we can just start taking actions, seeing what the rewards are and uh, learning about it. Monte Carlo methods require only experience, meaning we have some sequence of states, actions and rewards from either an actual environment or a simulated environment. So, so what do I mean by actual versus simulated environment? So actual experience would be something like if, if you have a physical robot driving around in the real world, right? And the cool thing is learning from actual experience does not require a model of the environment. We don't need to know like the dynamics or the physics of the real environment, uh, the complete layout of an environment or the full state space. Um, what, what's going to happen is that an agent is going to observe the environment. So it'll get an idea of what state that it's in. It'll take some sort of action, carry it out, then it'll get a reward, the state will change, and we'll update our value, and we'll update our policy. So it's really cool that we can just do this without a model. So we needed a model for things like search, but we do not need a model for reinforce reinforcement learning. When we talk about simulated experience, this is like a video game or a simulation, and but it's, it's really the same thing. We're not... Um, like we would use the same method, whether it's actual experience or simulated experience. It's just one is kind of, okay, this is the real world. A simulated experience might be a video game or a simulation. Learning from simulated experience is also powerful because we don't need to know how the model works. We only need to know the state transition function. So for example, if we have access to a game engine like StarCraft, we can do reinforcement learning um, in StarCraft. But we don't need to know exactly like um, if I press left here, what is the exact next state? We just need to be able to play the game and record um, rewards. So Monte Carlo does not need to know all of the action and state probability distributions, whereas dynamic programming does. So what really is Monte Carlo method? So Monte Carlo um, is a place where there are lots of casinos. And from that, um, you might infer some sort of randomized testing or sampling, and that would be correct. So Monte Carlo methods are used all over the place in numerical computing. And I just have one example here, which uses a Monte Carlo method to generate pi. So you say, how in the hell would we, would we do that? So it's actually really, really neat. Uh, what we have here is a square. And let's say that this square has sides length one. So we have uh, squares of side length one. So from here to here is one. That means if we inscribe or circumscribe, I can't remember which, uh, I think it's inscribe a circle in that square. Then if the full length of the side of the square is one, then the circle's radius is half of that. So it's 0 0.5. The squares area is one times one. So that's one. The circles area is pi r squared. That's the formula. And since the r is 0 0.5, then this is pi over four, right? So what we have here 
is we have pi over four is the ratio between the circle area and the area of the square, which is one. Well, it's pi over four divided by one, but that's just pi over four. So what happens is we have pi over four is approximately equal to the area of the circle divided by the area of the, of the um, square. So how can we actually get the value of pi? How can we calculate that area? Well, one way of calculating the area is to take samples. So if we just generate random points inside the square, some of them will randomly be inside the circle and some of them randomly won't be inside the circle. And if we take the ratio of the number of points that landed within the circle, and you can tell whether it's in the circle because you can just use the distance formula, divided by the total and multiply that by four, that will actually approximately be equal to pi. And so this uh, website that was in the bottom right hand corner there, oops, let me just open that up because I want to show you a little demo of this and show you that it actually works. So I take no credit for this whatsoever, but um, here you can add points one by one and you can see the current, the points are quite hard to see, but once I animate this and turn up the speed, you will see that it's generating lots and lots and lots of random points. And as we generate more and more and more points, the pi estimation is calculated and it becomes more and more accurate. That's pretty cool that it actually works. It's getting a value right up here, which is pretty close to pi. Now it's obviously not gonna get the exact value of pi, but it's gonna come in um, within a few decimal places, which is good enough for us. And so that is what a Monte Carlo method actually does. It takes samples and then use this, uses the statistics of those samples to calculate some value. We could do another example of a Monte Carlo sampling method to calculate the area of an integral. So for example, over here we have some function and we want to calculate the area under the graph in this, um, in this uh, range. And so what we can do is do the exact same thing we just did with the circle. So we're going to generate randomized points in an area. We can use f of x for the x value of that randomly generated point to see whether or not that point actually uh, lies above or below the function. And then if we just take the ratio of the points that were below the area, or sorry, below the function versus above the function, we know the ratio of the area below the function to above the function. And since we've taken a rectangular area, we can really easily find out what the total area is. So if we have the ratio and we have the total, we can find an approximate area of the integral. So Monte Carlo methods are used for way more than just reinforcement learning. Um, there's all sorts of stuff out there. You, if you took a numerical, uh, a numerical algorithms course, um, numerical methods course, sorry, uh, you would probably find several um, Monte Carlo methods in that course. So Monte Carlo methods are in the reinforcement learning world are able to solve reinforcement learning problems using samples. So it learns based on averaging sample returns. So we're going to generate lots of samples. We're going to be generating episodes and um, we get returns from those episodes and we're going to average out the returns that we get. So we're going to be discussing Monte Carlo methods for episodic tasks only in this course. And so all of our experience is divided into finite episodes. That means that all of our episodes eventually terminate, okay? So the value estimate and policy updates are performed only at the end of an episode. And we'll see what that means once we, once we do an example. So these Monte Carlo methods, they sample and average returns for each state action pair, just like bandits methods do. And so these Monte Carlo methods treat each state as a bandit problem. So last time when we were talking about bandit algorithms, we ended off by saying, okay, each state is going to be a bandit problem. And that's just like what Monte Carlo methods do. Each of these bandit problems are related because their return after actions that you take are based on the neighbor future actions as well. All right, so Monte Carlo prediction. Remember there's prediction and control. Prediction is where we try and estimate the values of actions and control is how we update the policy. So Monte Carlo prediction. The goal of Monte Carlo prediction is to learn the state values for a given policy. So if I tell you what you should do 
in a given state, then you should be able to choose an, uh, sorry, if I tell you what you should do for a given state, that's a policy, and the goal of Monte Carlo prediction is to use that policy to generate episodes to update um, and learn the state values for each of those states or state action pairs. So the value of a state, the expected return, um, sorry, the value of a state is the expected return starting from that state and following a policy. And so if we want to say, okay, what's the overall method that Monte Carlo is going to use here? What we're going to do is we're going to carry out an episode using a given policy. So we have a policy that is a policy at some time step. We record all of the states that we visited in that episode. We average the return after visiting the state, and then we update the value estimate of the state with the average. And believe it or not, this actually converges to the expected value, which is the true value of those states over time. So if we take enough samples, meaning we record enough episodes, then Monte Carlo prediction will converge to the actual value of states or state action pairs over time, which is pretty exciting. So just a quick note on the syntax. Again, this is a little uh, refresher from last time. What is a value? A value is a uh, expected return from a specific situation. So rem remember that V pi of S, that is the value of a state given a policy. So that's the expected future return when starting in state S and following action pi. And Q is the action value. So the, that's the expected future return when starting in state S, taking action A, and then follow, following policy pi. So we've got V and we've got Q. V is the expected value of the state, and Q is the expected value of taking an action at a given state. And Q is going to be what we're more interested in because we want to know what is the best action to take at this state. Just not, it's not just how much do I want to be in this state, but what is the best action at this state. So let's go through an example here, and I really like the game of blackjack. Um, if you don't know the game of blackjack, just pause the video here and go learn the rules of blackjack really quick. So blackjack is played in hands or episodes. Um, so we're going to deal out some cards, there's going to be a result, and then we're going to play again. So each hand of blackjack results in a win, a loss, or a draw for the player. What we're going to do to turn blackjack into a reinforcement learning problem is that we need to have rewards. And so the reward is going to be zero at every state except the terminal state, right? So hitting or sticking is not going to be giving me my reward. It's the eventual what happens to me that's going to give me my reward. So a win is going to get a plus one reward and a loss gets a negative one reward. And depending on the casino that you're in, sometimes blackjacks give you a plus 1.5 reward. Okay, so if you get a blackjack, which is a 10 and an ace, then you get more money back from that. And so what's going to happen is that we're going to have zeros for all of our rewards until we get right to the final state. And the final state, if we win, we get one. If we lose, we get negative one. If we get a blackjack, we get 1.5. So let's look at an example illustrated. So up here, we're going to have the dealer cards. And down here, we're going to have the player cards. And the cards are shuffled, and the initial state is after the two cards have been dealt to the dealer, and one card has been dealt to the player. So we deal two cards to the dealer. One of them is actually hidden from the player, which is the whole point of blackjack. It's you don't know what, what card here that the dealer has. And then two cards are dealt to the player. And so the starting state here, which is S0, the player has a sum of 7, and you don't know what the dealer has, so the state is going to be represented by the dealer having a 4, okay? So here we are at state 0, and we're recording this in sort of two dimensions as the player having 7 and the dealer having a 4. So this S0 means it's state at time step 0, so the initial state, the player has a total of 7, and the dealer has a 4 showing. Now, I have two possible actions that I can take. I don't have a particular policy in mind right now, but let's just choose actions from a policy that I might have. And I've just chosen them so that they're interesting for this example. So 
Let's say that I chose to hit, and that's probably a good thing to do when you have seven and the dealer has four. So I've chose to hit. And so hitting, that is A0. It's the action that I took at time step zero. So I have a state zero, action zero. Now I'm going to get a reward from the environment. And this is not a terminal state of blackjack yet. I do not know if I have won the hand or lost the hand. And so the reward that I get from that action at that state is zero. Remember, that's how I've defined this reinforcement learning problem. So that's the reward that I get. And not only do I get that reward, but the state has been updated as well. Because I get a two, so my previous state where I had nine, or sorry, I had seven, is now me having nine. Three plus four plus two is nine. So right now, we are at this state where it's state one. So we've taken one action, so we're at state one. I have nine, the dealer has four, and the reward from that first action was zero. Okay, now I'm gonna keep going until the end of the episode. So let's say that my next action, A1, is going to be hit again, okay? So I hit again, I get a five. And of course, this is not the end of the episode, so I get a reward of zero. And nine plus five is 14, and so S2 is me having 14, and the dealer having four. Let's do it once more. I'm gonna hit again. So that was, this is A2, that's hitting. And I'm gonna get a six. Aren't I lucky that I didn't bust? So now what happens is I get my reward of zero. So that's my third reward. I um, transition to state where I have 20, the dealer has four. And now my policy is probably gonna say something like, okay, you have 20, maybe you should stand. All right, so action three is stand. Or is that action four? Let's see. Oh, that, that, that is action three. So action three is now stand. So what happens when you stand in blackjack is that you've essentially passed the decision making over to the dealer. And now the dealer doesn't take actions like the player does. The dealer just follows a, a fixed policy. So in blackjack, you can think of the dealer as being part of the environment. And once I stand, then the game ends. But the dealer does need to get their cards first in order for the environment to play out to the end. So the dealer's policy in blackjack, always, is that they're going to hit until they get 17 or higher. So the dealer ended up having 9, then 12, then a king. So the dealer had 22. And so after taking my action of stand, we get our next reward, which is me transitioning to the end state where I have won the game. So state four is the winning state. It doesn't matter if the dealer had 22 or 27 or whatever. It just matters that I won, okay? Because that's how I get my reward. But maybe something else might have happened, right? Blackjack has randomness. Maybe the dealer could have gotten a nine instead of a 10 and gotten 21. In that case, I would have lost. So my reward would have been negative one and I would transition to the losing state. But maybe the dealer got an eight and got a 20, and so this would be a draw, okay? So you can draw or push in blackjack as well, and if that's the case, then I neither won or lost money, and so the reward here would be zero. So let's look at that numerically now. Here is our episode of blackjack. So the player got dealt a four and a three, and the dealer got dealt a four. So state zero was me having seven, the dealer having four. I chose as action zero to hit. I got a two and my first reward was zero, right? Because the game isn't over yet. State one after getting a two was me having nine and the dealer having four. My action was hit, I got a five and um, the reward was still zero. Then state two, because I got a five, now it's 14, four, I decided to hit again. I got a six, my reward was zero because the game isn't over. And then I got a 20, or sorry, state three, I have a 20, I chose to stand. And then some dice was rolled by the environment and I got, because the dealer, you know, their cards are random. And after I stood, I happened to be in a winning state, right? So the dealer policy happened to lead to the dealer busting in that episode. And so state four was me winning, and that's the terminal state, so I do not take any actions or get any rewards 
past that state. All right. So what happened is that we had a sequence of states that we transitioned through, right? So the sequence was we were at this state, then we went to that state, then we went to this state, then we went to this state, and then we finally got to this state, okay? So that is the sequence. If I go back, you see all the states here. That is the sequence of states that I went through. Also, there was an action sequence. So the actions were hit, 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 stand. Maybe you represent that as integers 1, 1, 1, 0, for example. I had a reward sequence as well. So I got 0 for my reward, 0, 0, and then win. And the future reward sum, if I want to calculate that, is, follow, is as follows. So to calculate the future reward for, for action 1, okay, all I have to do is sum up all of the values after that in this return uh, reward array. So the return here, this return array says, what was the sum of future rewards after this state? And obviously, since everything is zero and the last one was a one, then the return from each of these is just going to be a one. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is update my QSA value estimates because I have this returns of one. So I'm going to go through all of my Q array. We talked about this last time, how we update Q. So Q for this state, doing action one, we're going to update that with a new value, which is my return was one. So what's happening here and then when I go to the next state and update it for one, next state, update it for one, next state, update it for one. So, so what's really happening is for, let me go back, is I won this particular hand of blackjack. So what happens is after the entire episode, I'm going to go back and say that the value of taking this action at this state was positive. So the value, my value estimate for QSA at this location, I'm going to increase it. For this one, I'm going to increase it. For this one, I'm going to increase, well, I'm going to, I'm going to have a new sample of one, right? So what I do is I go through the whole episode and say, I won. So all the actions that I took for that episode, I'm going to say, well, the new sample was one. So update your values. Okay, so essentially, if I take specific actions at specific states and I ended up winning, I'm going to update my values of those actions to be more positive. If I ended up losing, though, I'm going to be I'm going to be updating my values to be more negative. Right. And the idea is after I play millions and millions of hands of blackjack. All of these will average out and you'll be able to tell at what states you want to hit and at what states you want to stand because it'll give you the correct values for those. So let me go back to here. So that's what this part is doing. We go through all of the state history and for each state, we look at which action that we did and we update with the return. So if we were updating state values instead of state action pair values, we would do update v74 instead. So here's the algorithm for that. It's pretty simple. So what we do, we start with some QSA, right? So those are the initial values for each state action pair. Actually, let me uh, turn on the old animated pull in for this. All right. So this is, um, this is called every visit Monte Carlo. We'll talk about what that means in one slide, but this is for updating state action pair estimates. So we're going to start with some array, some data structure, which is QSA, which the initial values for each state action pair, maybe they're all zero to start with. Okay. The returns for S and A, that is an empty list for each state, because what we're going to do is we're going to use the average update method. So we're going to keep track of all the returns, for every action we did at every state, and then we'll calculate some averages. Then, while true, this is where we do the episodes. So we're going to generate an episode with our current policy. So that'll give us a state, an action, a reward. State, action, reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward. Then, 
for each time step in the episode, I'm going to say sum up all of the future returns from this point, right? That is my return. Then I append that return to the returns that I got from that state doing that action. So for example, um, at first, this is going to be blank because I haven't generated any episodes. Maybe I'm at state me having 15 and the dealer having four and one action led me to winning. So I'm going to update that with a one. And then the next time, maybe it was a loss. So I update it with a negative one. Then all I have to do to update my value estimate for that state in action is take the average of all the returns at ST and AT. Okay, so, th so that's really easy. You just play out episodes. Then for each state that was in the episode and each action that was in the episode, you average the returns that you got following those, um, following those state action pairs. So our goal, again, is to estimate the value of a state or usually the value of a state action pair given a set of episodes obtained following um, policy pi. Each occurrence of a state in an episode is called a visit to that state. And each state may be visited multiple times in an episode. So we have first visit Monte Carlo and every visit Monte Carlo. First visit Monte Carlo estimates V as the average of returns following the first visit only. And every visit MC, its, it's theoretical properties are a little bit different. But every visit Monte Carlo updates the state value for a single state multiple times if it's visited more than once during an episode. This is not always desired. So the, the algorithm that we just showed, every visit MC, it has some strange theoretical properties. We may not want to do that. Um, so let's try updating states on first visit only. So what we do is this was every visit Monte Carlo prediction that this is the algorithm that we just showed. Okay, this is nothing new. To turn this into first visit Monte Carlo, we just add three lines, okay? So what we do is we add a visited list. So this says whether or not a state was visited. And we just check to see if we have already visited a state before we update it, okay? So we are only going to update the state action value estimate the first time we see a state action pair in an episode. And that just gives us nicer um, convergence properties that I'm not going to get into in this course. So here was the previous every visit where every time we may have seen a state um, in, a, in a visit, we, um, we would update its value. And here is the first visit where we only update it on the first occurrence of a state action pair within an episode. Well, you may say, well, Dave, why didn't we just use dynamic programming for this? Why did we have to use um, Monte Carlo? Because dynamic programming has all these nice properties. But the problem is, especially for games with randomness like Blackjack, it would be very difficult to compute values for Blackjack using dynamic programming, even if we have a model of the environment. So previously we said, okay, we can use dynamic programming if we have a model. And so we actually do have a model of blackjack. It's a very easy model. But for dynamic programming, we don't need to just know the model. We need to know the entire distribution of the next events, the next rewards, etc. So we would need to know things like if I'm currently at state 13.7 and I choose stick, what is the exact probability of winning? Now I could go figure that out for all the states but it turns out that for probabilistic transitioning environments, dynamic programming is not the best choice. And so these probabilities have to be known in order for to use dynamic programming, but they don't need to be known for sampling because we're just taking samples and we average them. So that's really cool. All right, so now that we have the state values, 
How do we form a policy based on those? Well, it's the same thing that we did in the last, um, last episode, in the last lecture. Without a model, we can't tell which actions lead to other states just using samples. So we have to calculate the value of doing an action at a particular state in order to know which action was best. So just look back at our uh, bandit algorithm example. So what we typically want to, um, what we want to figure out is we're very rarely actually doing VSA, which is the value of being in a state. We typically want to compute this QSA. So that is the expected return when in state S following action A and then doing policy pi. If I have repeated this this many times, it might be on an exam, okay? Just a little wink, wink. Exploration. Exploration is still important and we haven't done any exploration here. We talked about exploration last time. So for many problems, the number of states and actions is actually quite large. And so if we follow a given policy, we're going to be doing the same thing over and over and over again. It's kind of greedy like. So we must be careful to explore, choose actions and states that have not yet been done. Okay. So, so choose actions at states that have not yet been done and also explore with the states. So sample from states that have not yet been visited. So last time we talked about things like, um, epsilon greedy right? Where we take the greedy thing, which is what our policy says to do a certain amount of the time, but maybe a random action some other amount of the time. So we want to do that as well in Monte Carlo, right? So picture, um, picture you're rolling some dice, right? If you've got two dice and you want to know some game, like I want to know the optimal thing to do when I get two through 12 on two dice. Well, it turns out if all you do is roll dice, you get two, like the sum of one and one, way less frequently than you get a sum of seven. And so you're sampling the state seven far more than you're sampling um, the state two or the state 12. And so what this is saying is, well, just start the game in a bunch of different states sometimes in order to get um, uh, a good coverage of your state space so that you can learn more quickly and more evenly. So that is all about prediction. How do we do control? So now that we have the values for state action pairs, how, how do we update the policy? Well, this was just exactly what we did in the last lecture with the banded action selection. So we've seen how to estimate values given that we follow a fixed policy, but how do we update that policy to perform better over time? I sort of alluded to this at the, at the end of the last lecture. But hopefully, if we learn the values of QSA over time, we can learn a policy that approximates a, the optimal policy. So this is this whole loop that we've been talking, we've been alluding to, but not explicitly saying yet, is called policy iteration. And once we have a value estimate, we'll update our policy incremental over time and this process is called generalized policy iteration. So when we do GPI, which is basically the reinforcement learning framework, um, we maintain estimates of both of these things. So we maintain current value function estimates. So that's our Q and we maintain our current policy estimates, which is our pi. The value function is repeatedly update, updated to more closely resemble the true value function. So our Q values get more accurate over time. And the policy is repeatedly improved based on the value. So our estimates get more accurate, which means our policy gets better, which means our estimates get more accurate, which means our policy gets better. So the two main processes in GPI are policy evaluation and policy iteration. So the first one, policy evaluation, is evaluating our policy to see how well it does. So making the value function more closely estimate the value of the current policy. As we do more and more iterations of policy iteration, we get more and more confident about our, our uh, averages of those samples. And the second part is policy iteration, making the policy greedy with respect to the current value function. So in policy iteration, these two processes alternate and each one completes before the other begins. 
and GPI refers to the general idea of letting policy evaluation and policy iteration interact to improve a policy over time. And almost all reinforcement learning methods follow this and resemble um, GPI. So to sort of view this visually, what we have is the, the diagram over here, okay? So let's look over here first. First of all, well, actually, let's read this. So over time, two things occur. The values approach the true values and the policy approaches optimal. So over here, we can see that we start off with some initial policy pi and we start off with some value estimate. Maybe it's all zeros, call them V. And of course, this is also V or Q, depending on how we're doing this. We evaluate a policy and as we, as we do an episode with that policy and update our values, the values estimates that we have more closely converge to the true values of that policy, right? So as we take more and more samples from a policy, we learn more about the policy. Then once we have our values, we update our policy to be greedy with respect to the values. So now we'll look down here, okay? Down here, what it's saying is over here, we have the true values and the true policy, okay? Over here, what we start with is some, maybe some random values, maybe all zeros and some random policy, like literally random. And what happens is as we do policy evaluation, our values get more close to V pi. Then we do policy, uh, sorry, policy iteration, which means that we update our policy to be greedy with respect to the values. So what we get is we do evaluation, iteration, evaluation, iteration, evaluation, iteration. And what we see is over time, the values approach the true values of the policy and the policy approaches the optimal policy. And so we get this convergence where when we're done with this or after some amount of time, we are now hopefully very closely estimating the true values and the true policy. And so this generalized policy iteration can stop after maybe some number of iterations, or once you see that they stabilize, so you're no longer like changing your values or something, at some point you say, okay, here's my policy, and that policy hopefully is close to the optimal policy. So how do we apply policy iteration with Monte Carlo methods? So first we do policy evaluation, that's updating our value estimates after an episode has been generated. Then we do policy improvement, that's updating the policy based on the new value estimates, okay? So we start with a policy, we do evaluation, we update our estimates, we do uh, improvement, we update our policy, update our estimates, update our policy, et cetera, et cetera. So this is another way of looking that. And so all we have to do is the exact same we, thing we did last time. We look at our QSA and we choose the action A that maximized QSA. And that's how we update our policy for each state. So the overall algorithm for this is, in, is really, really intuitive and really simple. So here's our Monte Carlo policy iteration. We start with our QSA array or vector or neural net, whatever. We'll talk about that later. We talk, we, we start with our um, value estimate storage mechanism. That's our initial value estimates. Then we start with uh, initial probable, initially equiprobable policy. So maybe just a random policy, take all actions with equal probability. And then while true, we do this process of policy iteration. We generate an episode based on the policy we update the value estimates based on the returns of that episode, which we just showed how to do. And then we update the policy to choose the actions with the max values. So Q is going to estimate the true values of the optimal policy and get closer to those values over time. And P is gonna estimate the optimal policy and get closer to the optimal policy over time. So if you do apply this to blackjack, what you eventually get is something that looks like this, right? If you just hit or stand, you eventually get to the optimal policy and then you can go to Las Vegas and you can implement this optimal policy and you'll still lose money because blackjack is a losing game. All right. Last thing I wanna talk about is this idea of exploring starts. So exploring starts, I, I alluded to this before, 
but many problems have very large state and action spaces. And in practice, many state action pairs will not be visited very often if we just keep following our policy, right? So when generating episodes, it's important to vary the starting states, if possible, to ensure that all states get sampled. And the process of doing this is called exploring starts. So for example, if we were using exploring starts inside Blackjack, well, Blackjack is lucky because Blackjack, whenever the game starts, a new random hand is dealt. And so you kind of get exploring starts for free with Blackjack. But picture we were playing the game of chess, right? If you're playing the game of chess, you always start at the exact same state. And if you follow the same policy, you're going to have a bunch of games that look almost identical in chess or checkers or any other game like that. So what you should do is take some random actions sometimes or start the game in like random configurations or maybe start some games in losing states, start some games in winning states so that you can learn about a wide variety of the, the state space, not always just starting from the starting state. And this is called exploring starts. It means that if you are going to start an episode, start it at a randomized state rather than just the same state every time. And so in Monte Carlo ES, all returns for state action pairs, it's the same thing. You're just starting in random states. So they're just simply accumulated and averaged. And the cool thing is that Monte Carlo ES cannot converge to any suboptimal policy. Why? Because if it did, the value function would converge to the value for that policy, and then the policy would change. And so this is kind of this, it's like this self-converging mechanism where if you start forming a policy that is not optimal, then your values will go way down and you'll start choosing the better actions. So the only way that this can ever end is with you with the optimal policy. And so as of the time of when I wrote this slide a couple of years ago, the, the convergence to the optimal policy intuitively inevitably changes in the action, as the action value function decreases over time, but it, it hasn't been proven yet. So the, the absolute proof that this converges to the optimal policy I don't believe has been 100% proven yet, but in, in all experimentation and intuition, it does. However, in practice, MC with ES converges slowly because still, even though you're starting in different states, you're still just following the policy, right? And so you may not be exploring enough states. So we can also explore while generating the episodes. So just like last time we talked about action selection, so Epsilon Greedy or UCB, we can do this while we are generating the episodes as well. So by including those randomized actions, more states get visited, more actions get sampled, and we learn more quickly. So if I wanna sum up this whole lecture in, in one go, Monte Carlo uses sampling to generate individual episodes which have states, actions, and reward sequences. The value function estimate is updated at the end of each episodes via the rewards that were obtained. Then the policy is updated to reflect the new estimates. A new episode is generated with that updated policy. And so we do this um, new estimates, new policy, that's GPI. And varying the starting states and the action selection can help visit more states and converge to the optimal policy. The very, very last thing is that I want you to go watch this video right after the lecture, okay? So let me actually copy and paste this link for you. Um, this is an incredible video and it is called Menace and it is uh, from Stand Up Maths, so you know it's a good video. And it's about using Monte Carlo reinforcement learning to learn tic-tac-toe using physical matchboxes in the real world. So it's doing reinforcement learning without actually using a computer. It's amazing, okay? And so they use a different form where instead of 
taking GPI to mean updating values and then updating the policy, they actually directly update the policy. And so there will be a question about this video on the exam. I promise you. On the final exam, there will be a question. So please watch that video and pay attention to it. Now, I'm not going to ask you like the names of the people in the video, but know what is happening and understand that process because I'm going to ask questions about it. So some possible exam questions based on what was in this. And yeah, I, I don't want to play this because it's like a 15 minute video and it's on YouTube already. And I don't want to like free boot their videos. So please, please go watch that and give their channel the, the views that it deserves. So the exam questions, um, you should know the definition of Monte Carlo methods. Um, you know, we, we looked at some algorithms here, uh, VS versus QSA. What is the difference between them? Uh, maybe I can give you some samples, uh, like I did with the blackjack thing. So given some samples perform a Monte Carlo update estimation, uh, you won't need, I, I'll give you nice numbers. So you don't need a uh, calculator for that. Um, explain what exploring starts is, why they're important. Uh, the definition of generalized policy iteration, the two steps of generalized policy iteration, and all the content from that menace video. So that was uh, a bit of a short one today, but it's because last year I actually watched that video because uh, we were streaming to a different platform, but I don't want to do that um, since we're on, uh, we're no longer on that platform. All right, so keep in mind that um, if you're watching this live, this is Tuesday. Uh, the 8th of November, we have a uh, Remembrance Day is on Friday. And so um, this Thursday follows Friday's schedule. So that means that you have no lecture this Friday. So two days from now, if you're watching this live, you have no lecture. But I am going to go live on Thursday with a bonus optional lecture, which will be the Connect Four tournament. So the Connect4 AIs that you wrote, the TAs have compiled them for me. I have some specialized version of the assignment that will actually run that tournament. So I'll make an announcement um, about that on um, D2L and on Discord. So be sure to tune in for that. It's always really fun. And it it's way more exciting than you might think it is. Trust me. So it's it's worth tuning in to look at. But you can watch it at your leisure. You don't have to, to do it on your day off. So thanks a lot. Um, I really love Monte Carlo methods. They're super fun to program and they're super powerful. And uh, thanks for tuning in and I will see you next week, I guess.